So here's a little fun fact for you, you know, just in case you're either new here and or don't follow me on social media. Uh, I'm really into medieval history, like so much that I recently even turned in my master's dissertation on it and am still waiting to hear back on it. And even though I'm more of a 15th century politics person than I am a Viking person, I still have a bit of an interest in Viking history. Which is why, as you can probably imagine, I was really excited to finally get to reading Vinland Saga recently, and oh my god was I impressed on so many levels. But I am not here to talk about that because honestly, you know, there's already so many great reviews for Vinland Saga out there and I really don't think that there's much of anything that I could say about it in a review that hasn't already been said a dozen times already. So instead, I wanted to flex my history knowledge a bit and talk about one of my absolute favorite aspects of Vinland Saga. I want to talk about and appreciate the little historical details that Vinland Saga gets right and that really help demonstrate that its creator, Makoto Yukimura, really has done his homework. Oh, and speaking of things that I want to flex, by the way, uh, Bookwalker! This video is sponsored by Bookwalker, a fantastic site slash app where you can read a ton of your favorite manga and light novels, including Vinland Saga. Use the coupon code code REDBARD on Bookwalker for 600 yen off of your first purchase, and that's REDBARD, one word. There's a link in the description and in the pinned comment. In any case, to go ahead and get back on track, yeah, while there's definitely a good amount of content out there highlighting some of the historical details that we see in Vinland Saga, I wanted to highlight some of the lesser discussed ones. For this video specifically, I'm going to be focusing on ones in the Prologue Saga, which encompasses the first uh, four-ish volumes volumes of the manga and the first season of the anime. So with all that being said, let me tell you all about it. All right, so before I can get to the heart of this video, I first need to make sure that we're on the same page about a few things. For starters, that, just to reiterate what I said earlier, although I do study the Middle Ages, the Vikings are not my area of expertise. This is why I've consulted with Dr. Roderick Dale, who also happened to design the runes for the Vinland Saga covers and the book plate inside, for this video, you know, just to look over the fun facts I'm about to share with you and make sure everything sounds correct. Next up... I want to make sure that we're on the same page about what historical accuracy means, especially in the context of Vinland Saga. Right off the bat, for something like Vinland Saga, which takes place about a millennium ago, complete historical accuracy in its absolute purest sense is never going to be fully 100% achievable because there's just way too many gaps in our understanding of history, not to mention disagreements among historians about some aspects of it. Furthermore, Vinland Saga the manga is based off of Icelandic sagas which were passed down orally for several generations before being written down. In other words, although they probably have some inklings of historical truth in them. We do know, for example, that Vikings reached Newfoundland. Anyways, the Greenlanders saga and the saga of Eric the Red, aka the Vinland sagas, are not hard historical documents. So basically, this is all to say that when dealing with Vinland Saga, there is a bit of a difference between being accurate to proven factual history versus being accurate to the sagas and the over-the-topness and style that comes with them. So knowing all that, for there to be creative liberties in the Vinland Saga manga is more than just inevitable. In fact, there's a lot of cases where you could easily argue that it's a necessity. Now, is every case like this? No, there's some which I have very little doubt were done simply for the sake of storytelling or design purposes or something else to that effect. But despite that, Vinland Saga still generally does a pretty solid job of adhering to its time period and things we know about it. And in fact, I've seen it get a lot of praise for its attention to historical detail. In fact, really, this video is nothing else if not praise for its attention 
attention to historical detail. So to summarize, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that despite all the complexities surrounding it, the Vinland Saga manga still strikes a pretty good balance between fact and fiction. Alright, so now I just got one last note before I get on with the meat and potatoes of this video, and that is that this video is not, I repeat, is not meant to be like you know, an exhaustive list of tiny historical details in the prologue arc. I am sure there's more than plenty of them in there, but these are just the ones that I noticed and thought would be fun to discuss briefly in a video like this. All right, so now, at long last, with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and appreciate some of the smaller historical details in the Vinland Saga manga. looking thing in the corner right there. That is Ranveig's casket. So this right here is an interesting little item, which today is housed in the National Museum of Denmark. It's called Ranveig's casket because there's a runic inscription on the bottom that was added sometime around the turn of the millennium, and it reads, Ranveig owns this casket. In any case, this casket is very clearly made in the insular style of art, meaning that it was made somewhere in or around around Ireland or Scotland in the 8th century. It was then, at some point, brought to Scandinavia, where it was almost certainly repurposed as a reliquary. Footnote, a reliquary was something that you held a saint's remains in, and depending on a lot of factors like where you were, who the saint was, how famous they were, how many miracles had been attributed to them, and stuff like that, you could potentially have been sitting on something pretty valuable. Not all reliquaries were in this house-esque shape, of course, but this house shape is something that we've seen more than a few times in insular art in and around the 8th century. But yeah, to go ahead and get back to the casket, I haven't seen a ton of writing on this object specifically, but there is absolutely no shortage of writing out there on reliquaries, and a fair amount on insular art as well if you're ever interested in learning more. If nothing else, I sourced most of what I just told you from a cultural history of objects in the medieval age, so there's that. Yeah, the Vikings liked hair care. There is a lot, and I do mean a lot of viking combs that have managed to survive since a lot of them were made out of stuff like deer and reindeer antler. Like, seriously, personal speculation alert, but I suspect that outside of metalwork, combs are probably the next most numerous viking items that are still around. If nothing else, surely they gotta be top five. Either way, if you go to a museum with even a decent collection of viking artifacts, there is a really, really, really good chance that you're gonna see some combs. But yeah, to go ahead and get back to the combs themselves, uh, some of them, like the one in this panel, looked relatively simple, but there's a good number of ones that are pretty ornate. This tells us that hair care was probably pretty important in Viking culture, to say nothing of day-to-day -day life. I know there's a rampant stereotype that people in the Middle Ages didn't bathe and that hygiene was awful, and talking about this idea in detail would take way too long and completely derail this entire video. So, I guess I'll just leave it at telling you that even though medieval hygiene quite obviously wasn't then what it is today, it's also not as though they had no sense of hygiene or personal upkeep. Different cultures had different practices, and there's a plethora of writing about this, to say nothing of evidence archaeological and otherwise, which includes, but definitely isn't limited to, Viking combs. For more on the importance of Viking combs specifically, and what they tell us about Viking culture, not to mention day-to-day -day life, I particularly recommend Steve Ashby's A Viking Way of Life. Yup, the English city we know today as York was known as Jorvik during the Viking Age, and it was part of the Kingdom of Northumbria. Thanks largely to the remnants of Roman life there and its strategic position on the Usinfoss rivers, it became a really prominent city during Viking rule. It wasn't the first time that the area we now call York had power, but again, I'm not looking to completely derail this video. For further reading on the significance of Jorvik, I particularly recommend Don Hadley and 
Julian Richards' The Viking Great Army in the Making of England, and although I haven't read it, Dr. Roderick Dale mentioned to me that Viking Age Yorkshire by Matthew Townend was also a pretty good read for anyone interested in this. In any case, it's because of its prominence during the Viking Age that today, York has a wealth of archaeological evidence of what it was like there during that era, much of which is housed in the Half Dark Ride Half Museum in York City Center called the Jorvik Viking Center. I've actually been there, so for what it's worth, I'd say it's definitely pretty cheesy and I can see how that'd be off-putting for some people, but it's still a fun and interesting and certainly different way to learn about history. So, yeah, there's some appreciation for some of the little historical details in Vinland Saga. I'm sure there's even more that I didn't mention. You know, like I said, I'm not a Viking expert, and Yukimura very clearly did his homework, but, you know, I don't know. There's the ones that I wanted to talk about in any case. If you'd like to see another one of these on the farm arc when Season 2 gets closer, feel free to let me know. If y'all like this video and want to see me talk about more little historical details in the rest of the series, I would definitely be up for making another one of these. Especially since, you know, like I just said, the second season of the anime is coming up pretty soon. But in the meantime, if you want to get into the Vinland Saga manga or catch up in it or catch up in, well, plenty of other manga or light novels, again, you can use the coupon code REDBARD, and that is REDBARD, one word, for 600 yen off of your first purchase on Bookwalker. In addition to Vinland Saga, they have plenty of other fantastic series that you can read either on their desktop website or on their app that you can put on your smartphone and or tablet. Again, there's a link in the description and in the pinned comment. In addition to Vinland Saga, of course, lately I've been using Bookwalker to read the Inuyashiki manga, since I really liked the anime, and earlier this year I also used it to finally read the Perfect Blue Light novels. So, on that note, to close this video off, uh, behold, here I am with one of the funniest pieces of faux Viking history, the Hevener Runestone. No, but for real, Vinland Saga is absolutely the best manga that I've read in quite a while. If you haven't already read it, I would highly recommend it.